All right, so thank you for coming out to edmonton.py, the Edmonton Python user group. Uh, you can find us at edmonton.py.com. We've got a Twitter, Edmonton Pi, and we have chat channels. I think our channel is meetup Edmonton Pi on the Dev Edmonton Slack. So you can go to that link and sign up to Dev Edmonton Slack and join our channel and ask questions and promote stuff and what have you. So we are sponsored by Organic Box. So we're going to have pizza after the first talk. So let's give a thanks to Organic Box for sponsoring us. Yeah. And we're also here and sponsored by Startup Edmonton. And we're using their nice space and their projector. So let's give them a round of applause, too. All right. So when we're milling about after the uh, first talk, what we suggest is you maybe consider following the Pac-Man rule. And if you notice, Pac-Man is like a circular cheese shape with a wedge taken out. That wedge is basically the space that the speakers in that group aren't taking. So you can imagine the speakers in the group taking up the yellow space, but leaving an open wedge space to allow another person to enter and introduce themselves. So this is a method of having open groups to allow for people to interact, mingle, and not be so cut out of closed groups. So when you're talking in a bundle of people, consider opening up a little bit of a space to allow newbies in. Great. So when standing as a group of people, always leave, leave room for one person to join your group. And that's recursive. So once you do it, you also have to still make room. <laughs> All right. So there are some events coming up. Um, I'll cover the last two, and then I'll let Asha cover the first one. Pi Cascades 2020, that'll be in Portland. That's the most recent one. So that's a Python uh, developer conference for Cascadia, right? So that's like the West Coast and some of the prairies. And then there's PyCon USA, which is for the whole US, and that'll be in Pittsburgh in April. So, Asha. Um, so Polygot 2020 will be, that's an Edmonton conference uh, that's going to be sometime late February or early March, so I'm dropping the buzz here. Um, it's technically an unconference, so there's no pre-suggested talks and events. You just kind of show up the day of. If you have a talk that you want, you're interested in, you kind of pitch the topic and we get gather, the people vote on topics and um, um, the polyglot crew will pick the ones out that were voted the most and you can do round tables, fish bowls, talks, presentations, that kind of thing. It's one of the larger kind of get togethers across all the tech stacks in Edmonton. So I think last year we had about 60 people. I think this year we're aiming for about 90-ish people depending on the venue. So when the venue comes up, we'll know how many people and we'll know the exact date. So until then, I'm just dropping the buzz that Polyglot 2020 will be around in February, early March, and we'd love to see you there. Great, thank you. I was at the last Polyglot and it was pretty fun. There was different kinds of uh, sessions from birds of feather where you just chat to let's hack something to more structured lecture style, as well as like kind of lab work to do stuff. So it's really varied and quite fun. And it's also designed by who attends. So that's kind of cool. All right, in the news, Django 3.0 is released. So this, this is big, this is a major release. Uh, does anyone have a good handle on what the big deal is? Asha. It's foundational support for the ASCII interface. <laughs> oh. Asynchronous interfaces. Okay, well, that's cool. It's like the, the, the first foundation layer. So from now on, they'll be putting on the rest of the ASCII layers, but it's the first one to kind of officially have not only the whiskey, but then ASCII so that you can start to um, use a lot more of the asynchronous stuff in Django. That's the biggest, for sure. No, that's cool. So uh, Python creator and founder Guido Van Rossum, he uh, he retired from Dropbox around November 1st or so, and so he's also withdrawn from the Python steering committee. He's probably going to spend a lot more time with his grandkids, but it's also nice to see someone producing something that can carry on without them. So let's just give Guido a round of applause for his work on Python. As I mentioned before, PyCon 2020, uh, US registration's open if you want to go to Pittsburgh, that's cool, uh, lots of fun. Be aware that two malicious Python libraries were caught stealing SSH and GPG keys. 
One of them was called Jellyfish, but the last L was a capital I, which is totally sneaky, and they sneak away your keys. And the other one was really innocuously named. It was called, I think, Python 3 date util, which you might have pulled in by accident. Hopefully, you didn't import it. So, Python 3 date util, watch out for that one. Um, in other interesting stuff, uh, Python is now measured to. It's overtaken Java as the second most popular language on GitHub. So that's really interesting. And you can mostly trust this. GitHub does contain a ton of forks and all that, but I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable analysis. So there's a lot of Python files on GitHub now, probably more than Java files. What was the previous number two? It was Java. It was Java. Oh. And don't ask me what the number was. <laughs> Dang, damn it. Let's go click it. Let's figure it out. Um, that doesn't answer anything. Is that for more details link there? Oh, for, yeah, it's a tiny link. It's like one article to another to another. <laughs> Python slithers, that's cute. Uh, let's see. Is it JavaScript? Yeah. Oh, it's JavaScript, yeah. Oh, there we go. We got this hard to read. Thing. I'll just read out for you. So we got JavaScript, Python, Java, so they switched, PHP, <coughs> C Sharp, C++, TypeScript, Shell, C, Ruby. Now, one of the reasons you might not see things like C and C++ and Java as that popular is because lots of those projects started earlier and they use their own uh, version control hosting. They're not always so GitHub based. Like if it's Apache, they do use GitHub a lot, but they have their own uh, hosting as well. So remember, this is what's represented up on GitHub, not the entire world and not what your business does and all the code that we never see. So the, the dark matter of the software universe is not counted here. Okay, let's go back. So that's cool. Um, there's, sorry, someone want to say something? Does anyone have any other news they wish to share? We missed a bunch. <laughs> All right, we're good, we're good. All right, so there's a bunch of cool articles you can go check out. There's uh, these two on pandas. Basically, if you're coming from R, these, uh, two articles are pretty good about pandas and how to like deal with uh, loading files as well as group by. Merging in non-SQL senses has always been a kind of a pain and the group by article is about that. Um, there's this Python Botto 3 and AWS S3 demystified, automating AWS, all that kind of jazz. There's an article about what a Python key error usually means. I don't know what the article actually says. Oh, okay. See the error, um, what it actually means. I don't know, it's a weird title. I might have definitely miswritten this. Um, oh. But either one. Just well, the error, yeah. what it is. So it's not in the collection, it's not in the class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, GVR on how Python makes thinking, thinking code easier. Uh, GVR is that work we have across the Yeah. So this, <laughs> this is his. Um, <laughs> This is Python Dropbox last article, so it's worth checking out. Uh, how to test Django migrations. And then there's this neat article on detecting thinking intensity in the human brain, which is basically calculations on fMRI signals, functional MRI signals, which once you get on a computer, it's not so brain heavy, but it's kind of cool. All right, any other articles we should have looked up? Link to something cool you read. If so, share it in Slack. Oh yeah, we got the Slack. Slack's good for sharing those articles. Thanks. All right, so the Python tip of the day is Python sets. So Python comes with sets out of the box. And sets are cool because you don't need to use a dictionary to do the same kind of work. Sets are about sets of objects. You have a unique, they have unique identities, they work like mathematical sets. So here we initialize a set with one, two, and three in it. And then we initialize another set with three, four, five in there. 
So this is different than a dictionary because there's no values. This is like only keys, right? So this allows you to ask questions, hey, is one in that set? So I could go one in example set one, and it'll return true. That's kind of cool. So the cool thing about sets is you get to use three important set operators. The first is the union. The union is where you take all these elements and you join them into a bigger set. So you combine all the sets, and because it's a set, we remove duplicates. So there's not going to be any duplicates. So if we look here, there's a duplicate three here if we union them. But the output will be one, two, three, four, five. So this is a useful, useful way to join sets, basically take two sets of unique items, join them, and make sure there's no duplicates between them. Any questions about this one? No, this group uh, caters to people who don't know Python, to people who really know Python. So everyone's welcome. This is like, one way to visualize this is kind of like a Venn diagram as well. The link above the Python sets goes to a real Python article um, that kind of like explains it as well. Okay. So like a note okay. to add to this. All right. <clears throat> so union will join our sets together, and it can join multiple sets. That's kind of cool. Um, so that's when we want everything here, but sometimes we only want to know about the overlap. What exists in both sets? And that's when we're, we can ask for the intersection. So we go example set one, we call the method intersection on it, and then we give the example set two, and it says three is the only intersection. So it returns a set with three in it. So it returns a subset with three, that is the intersection. So that one's pretty useful because you can ask questions like, is all of this set in this set? Because if the intersection is equal to the set that you asked, then it's got the whole, whole shebang in there. So it's returned everything. So intersection's pretty nice. OK. Any questions about intersection? So in the Venn diagram, that's the overlap part. So you know when they have those diagrams of those two circles and they overlap? Right, the little middle bit, that's the intersection. The union is like both those circles joined together. All right, uh, the next one is set difference. Set difference has an order, so watch out for that. Here, we ask for the difference of set one from set two, okay? So basically means if we remove set two from set one, what is left over, okay? so. You can achieve this by looking at the intersection, and you see that in set one, three is the only intersection, so you remove those bits, and you're left with one and two. Now, you can reverse the order here. You could switch it to set two, example set two, different set one, and what would it output? Yeah, four and five, yeah, because the three would be removed because that's in the difference. Isn't that cool? Okay. So Python sets, super handy. If you find yourself just making a dictionary where all the values are true, you're probably looking to use a set. You should consider using a set. Any questions before we move on? I'm just like to throw in if you get annoyed with the ordering restrictions of the last one, sets also have a symmetrical difference method. OK. Um, then you just yeah symmetrical underscore difference and then get all the things that are not on Oh, yeah, yeah, both ways, yeah. That's normally what I expect from difference, so yeah. it's like, right. yeah, okay. So if you want the real set difference, the one that you did in your math class, it's symmetric difference. Great. All right, so we had two great talks today. I'm really excited. Uh, the first talk, the use of round in Python 2 and 3 by uh, Ken Harlack. And then the next talk after the pizza is going to be when Python becomes a couch potato, deferred evaluation with generators by Sam uh, Isabendu. All right, so let's uh, give our speakers a round of applause and Ken will come and set up. And in January, we have a meetup on the 13th. This talk is going to be on the use of round in Python 2 and 3. 
I was actually going to give this talk back in September, but I really had a bad cold and I literally lost my voice at the time of the, of the talk, so I had to cancel at the last minute. And this is the rescheduling of it. <clears throat> so what uh, my, my, my uh, approach I'm going to be, because this is a mixed audience and it's anywhere from individuals who know very little about Python to people who could probably code circles around me with Python, I, I'm going to start um, fairly, fairly low level and then uh, near the end I'll, I'll get to some more complicated issues uh, regarding float uh, calculations. So what, uh, what I'll do is I'll start with a brief uh, overview of Python 2 and 3 and um, I'll be using a lot of screenshots because I find that it's very, uh, it's very helpful to be able to uh, look and compare be between the two versions of Python to see what's going on. Uh, because there are some differences, but there are also similarities. Now most new development, Python 3 has been around for about a decade or so, most new development is uh, using Python 3. However, there's still a large body of what, um, I put it in brackets, legacy code, because it depends on how one defines it. I, I don't think of legacy code as being totally obsolete code. I just think of legacy code as being code that's been there, you know, 10 or so years. It might still be maintained, but uh, due to cost and whatnot, or if the code's not broken, it's working, because I've, like, I've worked in large enterprise settings before, and, and that can be the attitude of, uh, you know, it's, we're not going to upgrade unless, you know, we really have to type of a thing. So Python 2 is uh, present still in a good amount of uh, code that's being used. The version 2 was released back, way back in October 2000. And uh, there have been about 20 years of continual updates. And we're near the end of its uh, support from the Python organization. Now, just the end of support at python.org does not necessarily mean that you know, uh, institutions won't, won't be using Python 2 for a while. They, they, they might have, you know, they might have internal uh, Python um, resources who can make patches and whatnot. But per uh, Python enhancement proposal 373, version 2718 is going to be the final version. Uh, they, they had initially way back and, and they were going to uh, sunset it in 2014. And then I think it might have been Huido himself who, you know, made, made the declaration that, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll kick the can down the road for another five years or so. And uh, <clears throat> the code freeze is January 2020. And uh, the, uh, the release date uh, is going to be mid-April of 2020. Uh, the, the owner of, the, of uh, PP373, I think his name is Benjamin uh, Peterson, and he's, uh, he's been a long-term core contributor to, to the Python organization, and, uh, and he knows he, he and Guido have actually worked together at, at Dropbox when they were doing the big Python 3 upgrade. And, uh, and uh, Benjamin decided uh, he was going to have the release in April uh, and the whole thing that uh, I don't know if they have anything formally planned at the PyCon uh, 2020 in, in Pittsburgh but he wanted to sort of have it coincide with that particular gathering. So there's a bit of background. Uh, the Python uh, package index downloads. The, the actual source code for Python we you know we get it from the python.org but a lot of the user generated uh, packages that are used to enhance or plug into Python are, are put onto the Python package index repository. And uh, regarding uh, Python 2 downloads, one way of assessing it is what, what are the downloads uh, to the, to the, um, from the Python uh, package index. And uh, there was, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's not a perfect metric. Uh, there, this particular article that I've uh, put a link to, and, and I'll also in the next week or so, I'll put it onto the, uh, onto the online form uh, so you guys can, you folks can get the, get the link. The, it's a very lengthy article and uh, I didn't bother to put the, the, there's a bar chart and it was very cluttered so I didn't put it up there but the bottom line is, is from about January this year it started at about 60% of downloads from, from uh, the Pi PI. Uh, went down to 40% as of September but it's still a significant amount of downloads of packages for Python 2.7. And in the comments to that particular blog, there, there was more than one person that pointed out that that may not be totally accurate stat because a lot of large organizations, when they're doing automated testing, they'll be pulling packages down. They might pull packages down for you know, Python 2.7, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 
but then they do the download once, but then internally they might put you know, five copies internally for Python 2.7, 10 copies for 3.8. So this is just really a ballpark uh, figure. It's not, uh, there, there's really no perfect way of knowing how, you know, how much is still being used, but it's a pretty safe assumption that there's still a lot of use of Python 2.7. Now I prepared this slide deck back in September of uh, 2019 and at that time the current production versions of uh, Python uh, 2.7 was uh, release uh, 2.7.16 and 3.7.4 and, and I took a quick look. Uh, there have been some up upgrades uh, during the October November time frame but really not a, a lot that uh, is, um, should have any impact on, on this talk. The, the major changes typically, especially for built-in functions, tend to be between the major releases. Uh, they, they usually don't want to mess around with major functionality on, unless you know, a major release happens. Now the syntax, even though there are differences, the syntax is actually very, it's, it's basically identical syntax uh, uh, with, uh, as far as the, the format of it. <clears throat> so what you've got is round, and I highlighted, I uh, put it in, in red, as the, the, the square brackets mean that it's an optional parameter. So n digits is optional, and uh, what it does is it says how many decimal points, basically. So if it's zero, it means zero decimal points. If it's one, it's to one decimal place. And then the number is typically, whatever, it, it could be an integer, but it's typically a, a float. Now I'm going to be going through a number of examples and, uh, and again for those who are really familiar with Python they might find some of this initial stuff um, you know, fairly, fairly routine but I, I want to systematically step through this so that people can see what's going on and, and how things are different and similar. With Python 2 what you notice is um, I've, I've got a series of numbers 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7 and the rounding by default is, uh, goes to zero decimal places. However, here's the first, I guess you could say, feature of Python 2 is that it doesn't have integer, integer outputs. The outputs are always as a float. So you notice, even though you would assume by looking at the syntax of the round here that you get an integer output, it actually winds up tacking on a zero at the end. The uh, other thing you'll notice, um, is that it does a round up here and we'll compare this now to Python 3. And again example 1 correlates with example 1 between, pi between the different versions of Python for my slides. So the same set of uh, round values and uh, what you notice is that Python 3 is actually in a way more rational here. It actually puts out an integer without a, uh, a, a decimal point at the, at the end. So by default if, if you don't have any decimal places um, for the optional parameter it, it outputs an integer. And again the behavior is as expected, uh, it, it rounded up here. Um, the next one, uh, I'll get to so, some more detail here. With Python 2, the round, I went up in half, uh, half integer increments in a positive way. And what you notice is the pattern Round is at zero is at zero, and then round 0.5 and goes up to one. 1 1.5 goes up to two. 2.5 to three, and 3.5 goes up to four. So the observation here is that it's outputting um, a, a float, but it's rounding upward. Uh, and I'm focusing on the on the what I call the the the, the halfway uh, um, scenarios because when it's a 0.4 or 0.6, it's pretty obvious, but how the, how the 0.5 is handled if you're dealing with very large data sets can actually have an impact if the rounding goes wonky on you. And, uh, and this can catch people off guard if, if, they're, not, if they're not careful. So example two for, for Python 3. Um, again, let me just take a quick look. Okay. What you notice here that the behavior is it's showing an integer but what it's doing, it's doing what we would call banker's rounding. It's rounding to the nearest even. So it's uh, round 0 and round 0.5 both go to 0, round uh, 1.5 and 2.5 round towards 2 because 2 is even, and then 3.5 rounds up to 4 because 4 is an even uh, number. Now just to go back with the negatives, with Python 2, the going in half uh, integer increments, uh, from point minus 0.5, minus 1.5, to minus 2.5, minus 3.5, you'll notice that it's rounding 
down, but the what's happening is that before when it was positive, it was rounding up, now it's rounding down. So the, the behavior that they put in for the default for Python 2 is it rounds away from zero. So that's how the increment works by default for, for when they coded Python 2. And Python 3, when we're in negative numbers, and again using half, uh, half integer increments, what you notice is that the behavior is bankers rounding. It's rounding to, to the even numbers, uh, to zero, to rounding to negative two, and then rounding to negative four. So this is what we expect. And the problem is, um, oh, just another li little thing. Even though, even though the, the syntax is the same, there is some nuance in terms of how they behave with, with, with inputs. And I'll compare Python 2 uh, with, with 3. Python 2, what you'll notice, uh, round 1.5, of course, it, it's supposed to be an integer, but it tacks on a 0. And this is the equivalent uh, 1.5 with 0 um, decimal places, and it still behaves the same way. And then when I use the none type, which is in Python is basically that's Python's null, uh, Python 2 doesn't like it. It doesn't recognize it. And this is where Python 3 is different. Python 3 has some different behaviors. So I'm going to have the same sorts of numbers and the same commands. And what you notice, uh, 1.5 uh, rounds up to 2, and it's an integer. And what I noticed was interesting, and, and I, I, I kind of spent some time Googling, but I didn't you know, spend hours Googling this. Uh, 1.5, and then you put 0 for the parameter, actually puts, rounds it up to 2, but it attacks on a decimal place. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> some sort of a, maybe an undocumented feature, some sort of buried somewhere in the Python documentation. And then when I use the uh, none data type, it behaves well with, with Python 3. So that, that, that's basically the, the basic differences between Python 2 and 3 for the default behavior with round. So for halfway cases, which are the 0.5s, Python 2 rounds up or down away from 0. So depending upon whether it's a positive or a negative number. Well, Python 3 rounds up or down towards the nearest even number. And it's known as banker's rounding. And uh, it's actually, if, if you're really nitpicky about large groups of numbers, you want to do banker's rounding where possible uh, to, to avoid any sort of data skews. Uh, the round function always produces a float. Uh, even if you have zero decimal places uh, specified. But Python 3, the output can be an integer or a float, depending upon how you set the parameters when you're doing the rounding. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the banker's rounding avoids uh, data skews uh, with, with the halfway cases. And a personal anecdote, um, I, way decades ago, before I went into IT, I was originally a hospital lab tech, and I taught at the U of A for a while. I taught the students in that program. And we did banker's rounding, because uh, when you're dealing with large amounts of data, you want to do banker's rounding uh, when you're going from, you know, uh, a lab instrument might have, you know, uh, five, sig four significant figures, but the doctor only cares about data to two significant figures. And then we do banker's rounding to, uh, to make sure that it, it, it uh, rounds the proper way. Now, I use a term, I didn't know what to call it, I just called it strange behavior. Uh, and this is straight from the Python official documentation for both Python 2 and 3. The behavior of round for floats can be surprising. And if you're, and if you're not careful, and you, can, you can be blindsided by this because you could wind up programming, say, for, for a company where, which has a large data lake of data. And after a year or two, you could be programming data that you thought was cleaned up but might have been skewed because of rounding errors. And then you, know, you have to go back and try to figure out how to clean up what you did. Um, so the next set of slides. The next example, Python 2, I'm going to show the, the odd behavior. With, with Python 2, we're expecting uh, the numbers to round away from, from 0. So 1.75 rounds up to 1.8, 2.75, 2.8, 3.75 goes to 3.8, and 4.75 goes to 4.8. And look at that and go, well, that's great. That's exactly what we expect. And with Python 3, we get the same thing. Uh, it rounds up. And in this case, Python 3's default is it's rounding to the nearest even number. So you're expecting it to round up to, to the 0.8 from the 0.75, which is what we get. But now things can get a little strange. I'm going to take the number and I'm just going to increment from a 0.75 to a 0.65 with Python 2. 
And now what, you're, what we're getting with, uh, with, with, with Python 2 is it's only rounding up with the last number, with the 4.65. The other ones are giving an unexpected type of uh, behavior with, with the rounding, which, you know, if you're not familiar with what's going on, it, it's a bit of a head scratcher. And it's easy to miss if you're dealing with really large numbers. That's why I'm choosing really small numbers here. With Python 3, well, we're getting the behavior you're expecting initially. It's like, okay, it's rounding down to the, to the nearest uh, even number, or so it appears. But then 4.65 rounds up to an odd number. And if you're looking back, uh, at the other thing with, with the pattern that I should note is that not only are they not behaving by their defaults, they're also both behaving similarly in an inconsistent way uh, with, between Python 2 and 3. They're both producing the same outputs. And I'll get more into that as to why that's happening later on. OK, now just one more, one more cycle before I, I get, get to a slide with some text. Uh, Python 2 went down to 0.55. Now, we, uh, it's rounding away from upward as it, uh, as it should, but then later on it's rounding down for, for the 2.55, 3.55, and 4.55, which is not what you'd expect for Python 2. And then Python 3 is actually going to show the same behavior. Uh, 1.55 rounds uh, up, as would it be expected for Python 3 to, to, a, uh, to an even number. But the other two, three numbers, the 2 and 3 and 4.55 numbers round down. Uh, to an odd number, which again is not expected. But all of these slides comparing Python 2 and 3, and, and you can check it out again when, when, when this gets up on YouTube, the, uh, they're both behaving badly in the same way. And, and so there's something else happening. Now, they do not display their default, expected default round behaviors when we get to rounded to numbers that are to two decimal places. And this really happens when we start, when we get to two decimal places and onward, which is a big problem when you're dealing with, with, large value, with large amounts of numbers. The strange behavior, Python 2 and 3 are coded to behave differently in terms of uh, rounding uh, the, the, the half, the, the 0 0.5. So they're not behaving the way they should, and they're both behaving inconsistently in the same way. So what that's telling you, or what that's telling me at least, is that it's not at the Python language level. It's at the machine level. It's actually going a level lower. There's something going on with how are the, the, the computer handles the binary data that's causing this to, to flow into the Python, how it's doing its rounding, or how floats. Uh, and, and floats are notorious for, uh, for this issue. And uh, the root cause of this strange behavior is because we humans use base 10, but the computer needs to go to binary or base 2, so electronic ones and zeros. And the binary numbers, once you start getting into floats, kind of drift to <laughs> To, to really long um, numbers of decimal places, and, and which I'll give some examples later on. Well, the way that we, we're going to get some insight into this issue and the way that we're going to solve this issue is there's a module called the decimal module, which was, took a, it was a really big module, and there was a lot of work on, on their enhancement proposal with all the features. We're only going to look at one particular uh, uh, method later on in this module to, to, to fix this issue. So let's go into the Python 2 with the uh, decimal module. Now the decimal module is not built in, so you have to actually uh, import it. So, so from, the de from decimal, which is the module, import decimal. And decimal is the, the class or the object. And there's going to be methods that will be associated with that object, uh, one particular one that we'll use later on, or that I'll, I'll show. Now take a look. What I've done is I put a float into, into the decimal, and the decimal basically goes at the machine level and picks up the, the uh, binary for 1.55 as a float. And you see 1.55, but what the machine actually processes and what the round function is processing is this long number. And, and it can be up to, like this one I think is 53 decimal places. I think uh, the, 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 uh, the specs for, for modern, uh, say, computers like our laptops that we use is I think 53 um, significant figures. So, so you notice this number, it's, it's massive, and then when I uh, do a round of that float, uh, it goes to 1.6. Now it's not going to 1.6, like one would think, well that's the default behavior for Python 2, but the reason why it's actually doing that, it actually thinks that it's greater than 1.55. 
So that's why it's rounding up. So it's rounding up for the wrong reason, even though it appears to be okay. So go to decimal 2.55, you notice it's actually a little less than 2.55 at the binary level. So that's the reason why instead of rounding up, uh, when we do round 2.55 to one significant digit, it's rounding down. And it's because what's happening is that what you're seeing and what, what the round is actually pulling up from, from the binary uh, um, float is a totally different thing. So go to Python 3, and this also explains why Python 3 is behaving the same way. The same thing, uh, and these numbers are, <laughs> like unless you're, you're really good at quickly scanning these numbers, they are the, these are the same uh, as far as the past the decimal point. And, and again, uh, decimal 1.55 uh, to, to one place rounds up to decimal 1.6, but it's not doing it because of uh, rounding to an even number. It's doing it because it sees a number greater than 1.55 uh, at a binary level. And then 2.55 in, in Python 3 uh, rounds down to, to uh, 2.5 as opposed to rounding up to 2.6 to the nearest even. And again, because it's actually less than 2.55. Now, I'm doing some repetition. Again, it's for the benefit of the people who aren't as familiar with Python so that uh, you don't get lost as we, because I'll be progressing to a little more complicated things later on. Uh, second example. So we import, uh, again, decimal from, from the decimal module. And um, the, what, uh, what uh, I did here was 1.5. And what you notice is that 1.5 actually is only 1.5 at, at a binary level. It's, it's kind of a quirk. It's not, uh, I'll, I'll show you some more numbers later on, but it's one of those lucky quirks where it just happens to be that. It's not, you know, some weird long, long float number. And that's why the behavior was actually normal or, or as expected with, with the round. So round 1.5 rounds away from zero up to two. And then uh, again, 2.5, it's the same thing. It's actually 2.5 as a binary. And uh, round uh, of 2.5 goes up to three, which is the expected behavior. In Python 3, we do the same thing with the same numbers. And what you notice is that the round 1.5 goes up to two because it's even and 2.5 rounds down to 2 because it's an even number. Now, here's just a, a few more examples just to show you what's going on behind the scenes uh, with, with the decimal. Now, I should say what the decimal is doing here with, with the, uh, the decimal object, when, when you put a float in, it's pulling up, it's going and getting the binary float, but it's putting it into a string because the whole decimal module, the, the way that the, uh, they worked around this in Python because this was a big issue for, for mathematics was they had to actually take the, f the float at that binary level and convert it into string and then just use programming magic to, to make the strings behave like base 10. So again, uh, 1.4, 2.4, you notice it's actually a little less than 0.4. And also, it doesn't matter what the number is in front, the decimal is still the, the same number of... Uh, uh, digits for the float at, at a binary level, and 1.5 and 2.5 are exactly what, what they should be, and then 1.6, 2.6 is a little above. And then Python 3, again, I'll just briefly show this, it's the exact same sort of thing behind the scenes because, again, the issue is not Python, the issue is at a machine level. How is the machine handling, or how is your computer hardware handling the binary data? So the decimal data type. This data type was originally proposed in October of 2003, and I think from memory it was October 17th. Uh, I didn't put a link to that particular PEP here, uh, but it's a very lengthy PEP, and, and it's actually, in my opinion, more useful in, in hindsight, because a lot of things in this that was discussed that didn't get done, the actual uh, instructions in, in Python for how to, how to use the decimal module is, is a little more useful than, than looking at PEP 327. But, for those of you who want to see the history of it, it's, it's a really long enhancement proposal that was done. Um, and again, it was to deal with the math because uh, without handling floating math well, it's, it's re Python kind of is not very useful for, for large-scale scientific endeavors. Um, now, the way that they dealt with this is, is they, the, the decimal uh, data type um, is, uh, they, they put it to a string, but then 
what I'm going to use is I'm going to use one of the methods. There's many methods in, in the decimal module, but I'm going to use a method called the quantize method. And, and if you recall, like the term quantum mechanics, where things are in increments, this is what it, they're doing here. Is they're going to have they're they're basically forcing Python to do the the float calculation in increments so that you don't get these long string results. Um, and, and they deal with it programmatically, uh, taking into account how, how the machine behaves in the background. And uh, this will allow for, this is the most straightforward way that I could find to, to deal with, with this. There's, with math, you can sometimes have very circuitous ways of dealing with problems. This was the most straightforward way uh, that I thought I'd use for, for an example, um, and the only one that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, decimal uh, for, for, point, for Python 2. Okay, so we import decimal. Now what I did here was I, I took a float and I put it into a, a variable uh, called float num. So it's going to be typed as, uh, Python's going to implicitly type it as a float. And I do a round. So I round the value of float num to one decimal place. And uh, what you notice, it's of course behaving badly because it's not rounding away from zero. And if you do decimal with float num, the 2.55, decimal pulls this string up from, 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 the, uh, from the binary. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what can be done to deal with this and to process numbers. You can take your float number and you transform it into a string. So what I've done is I've taken the float number, I've processed it uh, as a string and put it into a string num variable. And uh, now when I put string num, decimal already sees it as a string and is going to deal with it as, as just 2.55 without anything else. It's not actually going to look you know, at, at, at the machine uh, binary for the float. Now, the way to do rounding in the decimal module is basically it's a method of decimal. It's the quantized method. And what you do is you take your string number. In this case, it'll be 2.55 was the value of the string num variable. And we're going to quantize it to one decimal place. So what it's going to do, it creates an output of 2.6, which is exactly what we expect. That's the, uh, what they did with, with, with the decimal module is that they were able to enforce the default behavior for, for the Python with the rounding. Decimal for Python 3 is the same thing. I, I, I picked a slightly, I did pick a slightly different number because I wanted to illustrate something else here. Uh, 4.65. Now, if, if we uh, round that as a float, it should round down to 4.6. It should round down to an even, because that's Python 3's default, is banker's rounding. Well, it didn't. It rounded up to an odd number. So we, we take the float num into decimal, and decimal pulls out the binary, uh, the, the, the base 2 number, which, of course, it turns out to actually be greater than 4.65. And, uh, and that's why it was rounding up. So now what we do is we're going to repeat what, what was done before. Take the float num, uh, put it through the, put it through the uh, string function to create a string uh, ver version of that number. And then that string num, uh, if you put it into decimal, decimal just says, OK, it's a string. I don't have to you know, go, go looking up this number as, as a binary float. And then it'll actually treat it as a base 10 number in terms of its internal processing. And then again. The uh, quantize method uh, is used against the string version of that number to one decimal place. And you notice now it's behaving properly. It rounded down to an even, uh, the nearest even number, because banker's rounding is what's done in Python 3. So problem solved, uh, and, and a very, very elegant, simple solution. Um, it took me a while to find it, because the, that uh, decimal module, is, it's a massive module. <laughs> And I'm, I spent a lot of time on, on Stack Overflow, and I found it to be not very helpful. I was by chance that I kind of actually found what I needed to find eventually. Um, float rounding. Conclusion. Well, if you're to minimize errors when rounding float data in Python 2 or 3, you use the decimal data type and its associated quantized method to properly uh, handle floats. And, and this is really critical for the half rounding uh, with, with large amounts of data. And, and in fact, anyone who's doing uh, large number crunching and, and science or any other thing really has to you know, get familiar with, with, with the uh, decimal module and, and, and how it behaves, because there's a lot of neat stuff in there for, for handling numbers and making sure float doesn't, uh, the default binary float processing doesn't catch you off guard. And that is it.
And I will, uh, I'll try to, let's see, under promise and over deliver in the next week, I'll try to get, the, there's a number of links that I put up on, on this. I'll, I'll get it on to the, uh, to the uh, what do they call it? It's the Slack channel that we have, yeah. And I think the, we, we have a Python Slack channel that's, okay. That is it. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Right there? Yeah, how does Python save the 4.65 if you flow so that it recognizes it when you get the string, but it doesn't recognize it as 4.65 for all letters? Okay, now, now bear in mind I put this to a string num. You can't, for normal processing, I, I didn't bother doing regular math. Now, it's not going to, the, the string ver version of that number is not going to behave well for normal mathematical stuff. You have to basically run things, as far as I know, through the decimal module. Uh, so are, are, are you, not, I, I, maybe I didn't quite catch what you were saying. So, so when you say store 4.65 into flow down of the second line there. Okay. Um, how is Python actually saving it so that it knows that it's 4.65? It's, 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 yeah, what, what it's doing, Python, as far as I know, what it's doing is saying it's, this is a number, it's passed, it's not an integer, therefore it's a float. So what it does is it categorizes a float, and then what happens is that, Python may have 4.65, but what happens is at a machine level, uh, because re remember that the programming languages actually operate uh, on top of the machine, and the machine can do things differently. The machine will go, okay, that's 4.65, and I've got to put it to 53 significant digits in, in binary uh, or in base 2. So this is your 4.65 in base 2 is the, uh, the decimal float number, the 4.65 with all those characters. So what happens at Python is it may, may only see 4.65, but when it's actually putting it into memory, the behind the scenes, the machine, the, the for what, like I'm not familiar, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with, you know, the, the, the real internal guts of, of machine language, but, but this, is, this is actually a problem for quite a few programming languages. The, the whole float thing uh, can, can blindside you if you're not aware of this, of this issue. And Python, each different programming languages have different, probably have their own ways of dealing with it, but Python, what they did was they made this huge, massive decimal module. And, and again, if, if you look that up, and I'll, I'll provide a link for that uh, on, on Slack later on, it's, there's a, an incredible amount of functionality. And, and in all honesty, I would say uh, if any, you know, anyone who's doing work with, 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 uh, with float numbers really has to be using the, the, the decimal module to, to avoid getting problems with the data, which you might not catch for a long time, and then all of a sudden you can have a whole mess to clean up uh, later on. Okay. Yeah? Did you try a fraction? Ah, uh, no, I, uh, I didn't. I didn't. I, I'm actually, I should give some, um, I, uh, I basically, I, I tried to keep the scope kind of narrow, uh, partly for, for time, but no, I, I, I didn't try, I didn't try fraction. Okay, okay, yeah. I'm actually, and, and also, I'm, I'm actually re somewhat new to Python. I'm actually not a, you know, a, a, someone who's had years, I've had years of experience in IT, but, but more in the database and, and enterprise resource planning software. So Python is actually, I'm still ramping up a bit on that. But uh, yeah, it's, as far as I know, uh, yeah, and fra I, I would assume fractions will probably in, in the background behave similarly, but uh, and I, I think there might be other math modules. I, decimal is one module. There might be other math modules. I, I don't know if like SciPy or there's some, there are others here probably know of. That's, that, that's a good question. I, I would assume because NumPy, I'm assuming it was, it's, was tailored more for, for numeric handling. And I would assume, when, when did NumPy come out? Did it come out after? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know, like I mentioned, the enhancement proposal for, for this whole decimal module, the enhancement proposal was started in, in October of 2003, and I suspect they were already working on the issue back then. And uh, this, the, the decimal module actually was released. Uh, it would have already, was, I think it was already released when Python 3 came out back in about 2008, and it was also released back with Python 2.4.
So, and of course they were probably doing enhancements to the decimal module. So I would assume uh, someone might have access to Google here, but I would assume if NumPy dealt with this, they probably, uh, NumPy probably came out, you know, in the 2005 to 2008 time frame would be my guess if they, they went? Okay, so so it so be pretty safe to assume that they already had that in mind. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, for, it's, it's, not, it's not so much an issue for people that just do regular math calculations, but if you're doing a lot of heavy duty float calculations, uh, th th this, was a, this was an issue that the, the, the Python community had to deal with. And I think they had to put a lot of manpower into that because if you look at the functionality of of like their decimal module, and I remember looking at it thinking there, there, were, there was a lot of hours of coding that had to have gone into that. So basically all they're doing is they're emulating the way that we would perceive base 10, despite the fact that our machines are using base 2 in the background and totally making floats look wacky with, because of the significant digits that, that were being used. Sorry, for, for my ignorance, I don't know about Python or anything. Um, so you say Python 3 round up to the even numbers, right? Yes, that, that, that was how they coded it uh, for its so default. I mean, well, round it up or down to even. Yeah, okay. So let's say uh, 1.5, mm -hmm. round it up to 2 yes. is easy. But what happens if you have a number between 1, 2 to close to 4? between two and... Uh, like three is not even number, right? Yeah, three is not an even number. So if you have, let's say, 2.5 is going to be two. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you have three? No, how about this? Let me just... So it's... It, well, what, what's happening here, there's actually not, not a... This is actually not, not a round uh, because... I'm just trying yeah. to say, let's say if you have 2.8. Okay. It's going it's, it's gonna to round up. But, yeah, what, what, what happens is that the, I focused on, uh, and I should make it clear, I focused on um, the rounding for, for the 0.5s because that, that, that's where the whole uh, oh. ish, issue was. Yeah, the, like the other rounding, if it's 2.4, or three or two, well say if it's point one, two, three or four, it, it rounds down. Whereas point six, seven, eight, nine, it rounds up. The, the issue is where, where people, where we get caught is with the point five, because point five, when you have like, say if you have like millions and millions and millions of data points, there's gonna be a significant number of them are gonna have point fives. And if the rounding is, is wacky with the, at the point five, you could wind up skewing, it might only be like, you know, 10%, well, might only well it could be you know what one one tenth of the data could wind up being skewed in the wrong direction because you're not doing uh say say bankers rounding where half of it goes up and half of it goes down to to the even number uh, for for some applications it might not be a big deal but for for yeah. for others it it, so it it is significant is 2.9 i know you said that you only round 0.5 but if you have 2.9 so you will round it down to two no, two point, well, well okay, the, the, the default is a round up. You can, and again, I didn't, because of lack of uh, time, because this isn't like uh, a one hour talk, there actually are in math, there's mathematical modules, and, and it might be the decimal module, I'm not sure, but where you're actually able to specify. You can actually force Python to always round down or round up. Like there's about, I think, eight different modes. And in fact, let me, I, I had, um, let, 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 me just, uh, let me just go back to the slideshow. I, I, did, I, I did have some slides, uh, uh, decimal module. The, these are, I didn't, I, I was going to talk about this and then I thought, okay, that, this isn't a one hour talk, so I, <laughs> I, had to, I had to cut it off at some point. But there are, as far as I know, in the decimal module, there are actually rounding options and you can look it up in the Python. There's actually eight options. I've just put four here that, that are quite self-evident. So, so yeah, so you can actually, for, Python has its default, but you can actually force Python to do certain things if you want to using the decimal module. Okay? Thank okay, thanks for the questions. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I kind of did an informal poll during the break and I get the sense there are lots of experienced Python programmers in the room. 
And so I'm going to start off by setting expectations. I only seriously started to learn Python about a year ago. And so I was in business school and I got really excited about data analysis and I wanted to be a data scientist. And there were lots of learn Python in two weeks courses out there. So I started, oh, I got this. Two weeks, okay, I got this. <laughs> but then I got started and I quickly got over my head. Like I didn't even know how to define a dictionary versus a list. Is it a curly bracket or a square bracket? Like, hmm. But then the text I was following said, if you understand iterators, generators, and comprehension, you are ready. So that was like my big goal, understand iterators, generators, and comprehension. Um, so this talk is mostly me applying the Feynman technique to kind of consolidate this uh, concepts. So if I make mistakes, feel free to call me out. Um, and if you're a very experienced program programmer, try not to fall asleep. <laughs> yes, so um, before I talk about generators, I should talk about iterables and iterators. So an iterable is a Python object that is a collection of other objects. So like a, a string is a collection of characters. A list is a collection of whatever it is you have in the list. Um, a set is a collection of whatever it is also you have in a set. And how you would know that an object is an iterable is if you can iterate over the elements in a, say, for loop or whatever. Or you can also call the iter method on the object and you get a incoming stream of data. And I mean an incoming stream of data in the sense of, say, I have the string, and <laughs> I call the iter method on the string, and I t check the type, I see an iterator, then I can just say next, and it gives me the next element. Next, it gives me the next element. Next, it gives me the element, next element. So that's an iterable, and I can make an iterator out of it. So generators are just a lazy way to build iterators. And I mean lazy in the sense, so when I used to grow up, my mom used to call me lazy a lot. So if you ask me to do a chore, I would typically forget, sometimes intentionally. And even when I remember, I procrastinate so much and I only do it to the very last minute. So two things, my memory bandwidth was very small and I tried to optimize. And my computational efficiency was so low that I defer evaluation on my house chores until the very last minute. And that is what generators can do for you. So they help you to optimize memory and the defer evaluation. And what do I mean by all of those fancy words? Say I have the most common or most popular built-in generator in Python is the range function, um, Python 3, I mean. Um, so say I make a range object, I want to do range 10. Yeah, I make the object, but when I check, it's not a list. You typically expect this to be a list, but it's just a range object. And to actually get the items out of that list, I either need to iterate in a for loop or I can just materialize as a list. But the object itself is, I don't know, a generator. Like you, can, you only, to get the objects out of the generator, you need to actually iterate or materialize as a, as a list. And there's a subtle difference between how the range object is implemented in Python 2 and Python 3. So in Python 2, if if you want to use the range equivalent for Python 3, it would be the X range function. Because the traditional Python 2 range function would just produce a list out of the box. So how do you make generators? Um, so typically that would be, the first way would be to use a generator function. Um, it would be similar to the way you define a traditional function in Python, but the only difference is instead of the return keyword that you have at the end of um, the function, you would use the yield keyword. So what do I mean by this? Say I want to <coughs> define an infinite generator, so I just want to generate numbers till infinity. Um, I'm saying y true, that means it's, an, it's a, a loop. I'm yielding i and then I'm incrementing. And the point where I say, so there's also one sub two difference. In a traditional function, a typical Python function, once you do return, anything that you have after the return function will never get evaluated. But for the yield, if you're defining a generator, you could have like multiple yield statements. So I could yield i and then yield i plus one and then do the increment and continue. So um, this is my infinite generator. And if I check the type, I see it's a generator type. Uh, every time I iterate, I iterate through the generator, 
it keeps track of where I start, where it was the last time, and when I call it again, it, returns, it returns the next value. So with a typical function, once you get to the return statement, execution is paused, except it calls a function within. But with a yield statement, each time you call yield, each time the function gets to the yield part, it executes that, it pauses execution, passes execution over to whatever function that calls it, and then if you call it the next time, it remembers the value you returned the last time, and it returns the next value. So say I have, I made that infinite generator, I call next, it returns zero, and next time I call next, it knows I returned zero earlier and it returns one, and I can keep calling next, next, next. And if you have a generator that has a finite number of elements, if you exhaust the number of elements in the generator, then you get a stop iteration error. Um, so let's say I'm defining a small generator that just yields numbers between zero and two. And if I try to run that, I just put that in a loop, but I didn't want the to get execution in an, iteration, in an error, so I just cut to that stop iteration error. And you see when I get to the end of the items in the generator, it just prints that statement saying I'm at the end of the, I've exhausted all of the elements. And the second method to um, build generators would be using generator expressions or comprehensions. Um, again, similar to how you would define a list or a dictionary comprehension, if you're familiar with this, but just the only difference is part of the problem I was struggling with when I just started. With a generator expression, you'd use um, parentheses. Um, with a list comprehension, you would use square brackets, and with a dictionary comprehension, you would use coily braces. Um, just as an example, I have a list of names, and I want to find all of, make a generator with all of the names that start with S. Um, so that list of what I do in the first line is basically, I take that string and I split it. The split method would make a list out of the elements that I have in the string. And then I define the generator expression in the next line. And I'm saying, give me a name for names, for in every name in that names list, if the name starts with letter S. And I can check what the type is. It's generator, I can, again, I trade over, or I can call each element using the next method. So what are the benefits of having generators? What do we really get from being lazy, being a catch potato, and deferring execution? So benefit number one is I can save computational time. So to demonstrate this, say I want to print every leap year from epoch zero up to a million years. Right, that's a really long list, if you can imagine that. So I'm saying, well, I'm basically defining a function, say, at each point, I call the import the calendar object. If it's a leap year, add it to that list. And then, um, I wasn't going to materialize this entire list because it's a really long list. I just took a small slice around uh, the years that I expected most people in the room to either be born or maybe the future Python stars that will come here to be born. And that is the list that we see here. So if I wanted to, I'm trying to time how long it would take the CPU to materialize this list. And it does this in 178 milliseconds. So if I did this instead as a generator, how long would it take to compute? So again, I define this as a generator. Um, and I'm saying, okay, let me time this. How long does it take? 400 and 27 nanoseconds as opposed to 178 milliseconds. That's at least 10 orders of magnitude faster. So that's a lot of computational time saving. And again, memory, that's another advantage we get from using generators. Um, I just use the sys, uh, sys method and I want to get size off. And what get size off does is it will tell me the size of an object in memory. Um, and I can see the least equivalent of that um, collection of leap years that we did earlier. It's 8.6 million bytes. And if I were to implement this as a generator using the simple generator comprehension, it would be just 128 bytes. So that's how many other sub magnitudes? That's a lot. So really, um, generators would be useful where you have iterables that would not easily fit in memory. Say you have an entire book and you have only in an eight megabyte um, 
computer and you have to process the text in that entire book. Obviously, you don't want to make a list. You don't want to read in that entire book as, say, a text file and then open that and load all of that into memory. Um, you probably want to do that as a generator. And then you only take a slice at a time, process, store the results, take the next slide, process, store the results. That way you avoid having to materialize the entire text in memory. And then related to this, um, one last thing I wanted to mention, there's some really cool tools from, so let me rewind. As a person just coming to Python, there are lots of tools in the standard library that you may not, or uh, some additional modules that you may not be aware of the functionality that you can get from using those. And one of these is the ITA tools library. So say I wanted to, that infinite generator I made earlier, right? It would keep generating numbers for as long as my computer can keep running, say. Um, but say I had a use case where I want to make a very large generator, but I want to make a very large object. Avoid using the word generator. So I want to make a really large object, but I only want to be able to take a small slice at a certain time. Um, if I did this as a generator, there are very cool functions from um, the Itatos library that I can ac actually use to take a slice at a time. So if I were to materialize this infinite sequence that I defined as a list, obviously bad things would happen if this were part of a larger program, if it's just on your local machine when com modern computers are um, versatile enough or robust enough to handle all of this, but still at some point you probably need to hit um, keyboard interrupt to get the ex to um, stop execution. But I could um, use iSlice from the Itatools library and say, I just want the first 10 slices of this infinite sequence and it would make a slice and then I can do whatever I want to do with this slice. I could materialize it as a list, I could process it and store the results somewhere and then go take the next slice and keep doing this. And hopefully if I was doing this as a part of a larger program, then I would never get to the point where the program would eat too much of the resources, compute resources that I have available. Um, other useful functions that I would recommend from the Itatos library, um, cycle, cycle is when you have a finite connection of elements, but you want to keep cycling between them. So I can mentally picture this also as how you would implement like a traffic light signal. You're always cycling between red, yellow, and green. So you could um, build a side, have, you have a fixed element, but you always want to go. So you say you go red and you pause for 15 seconds or 20 seconds, and then you cycle to green and you pause for a certain amount of time, and you cycle to um, orange. Um, you could use uh, um, the cycle function from intertools for this. Others are like the chain, zip longest. So typically, um, when, you're, when you're zipping two elements in Python, you can only zip for as long as the smallest uh, um, object that you have. So you have, say you have a list of 20 elements and you have another list of five elements. If you, list of five elements, if you zip those two lists together, you can only zip for the first five elements because once you exhaust the shortest item, then nothing happens. But with the zip longest function, you could um, define what you want it to fill, null values when it exhausts the smaller um, elements, and it just keeps going. Permutations, combinations, if you need, um, if you use Python for like um, number crunching use cases, I can imagine needing to like make a permutation from a set or make combinations of elements. This would also be useful. Um, I just do a simple demo example. So I say I have a list of lists, which is something I as a data analyst has often had to do. Say I have a list that has five lists embedded and I want to flatten this and I just want like one flat list of lists. Um, I can easily use the chain function from Itatos and just flatten the list of lists. So say I had a list of lists that um, I'm taking numbers between 10 one list is numbers that are divisible by two, the other is numbers divisible by three, and the, the last one is numbers divisible by four. I can flatten this using its at all. And finally, I would recommend, if you are new to Python, absolutely, absolutely check out the collection, collections library. It has tons of um, functions that can save you a lot of time 
if you're really a lazy person and you want to avoid um, building things in Python from the ground up, check out the collections library. So things that I would easily recommend off the call from the collections library is say, name tuple, um, default dict, or DQ. So DQ is really useful when you have want to make a double-ended queue. With a typical queue in Python, you can only pull from, it, it would be like a first in, first out. So you add from the front and you pull, you add from the back and you pull from the front. But if you want to make it double-ended so you can pop left or pop, pop right, then the DQ um, function will be useful for that. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs>